guest today is Brother Amiri Baraka, noted poet, essayist, playwright, Obie Award winner, and a brother who for more than 40 years has been one of the most profound, fascinating, and provocative voices that this country has ever produced. Black arts began with um, a group of black artists who were living downtown in the village, Lower East Side at the time who were in contact, we were in contact with some people uptown, you know, in Harlem, and some people from Philly, and some people from other places. And at the time, based on, you know, just the buildup of what was going on in the black liberation movement itself, you know, Malcolm X particularly, civil rights movement before that, we wanted our art to more and more reflect, you know, the black liberation movement itself, and say the things that the black liberation movement was doing. But see, the way things were going in, you know, in the United States, you could actually perceive that the stuff was getting ready to get like that. Malcolm had come on the scene, and he was actually laying it out that, uh, you know, civil rights movement was over. People weren't going for nonviolence or turn the other cheek or we shall overcome, you know, self-defense was beginning to, you know, be impressed on people's minds. Oh, wake up, black man. Wake up. Clean up. Stand up and take what is rightfully yours. Take what is I know when Malcolm was killed, that was, uh, sort of the time uh, many of us who were down here who had already conceived of the idea of black arts by the end of 64, that we actually started to uh, leave the village and the east side and, you know, move into Harlem. I remember we thought, or we were conscious then that it seemed like it was war. Because when they killed Malcolm, we all thought that that, that must be a declaration of open, you know, violent warfare, you know. So for about a year, we were in there and we had classes and, uh, you know, in politics and in acting and in, uh, you know, history and so forth. Uh, we put on plays. And then the summer that year, 65, uh, throughout the whole summer, we put on plays on the street corners. We'd, one night we'd be on this corner, next night we'd be on another corner, next night we'd be on another corner. Uh, as a matter of fact, each night we would have music on one corner, a play on another corner, an art exhibit on another corner, right, oh, and, and poetry on another corner. We had four things happening at the same time. And these were plays that were written based on, you know, us actually, you know, observing, you know, what was happening, you know, with the masses, what their struggle was, and, you know, uh, we thought that, you know, the writers need to speak to that. You know, like Mao says, you, you go to the people, and then you create what it is the people are talking about, only you make it bigger. You make it larger than life, and you bring it back to them, you know, so that they understand it's their, actually their ideas, and all you've done is, is reorganize it. From the top. It's true, I tell you, it's true. You're saying that Hayes has few problem votes. You know, it was very interesting because, um, for instance, Dutchman had just won the Obie Award in 64, but when we did Dutchman uptown in the streets, then the congressman and stuff said it was racism, you know. It's very interesting that, and then that began to teach us that the minute you try to like take art to the people, you know, when you actually try to, you know, like let people understand rather than these little middle class suburbanites who are just drifting through half drunk, you know, when you actually try to reach the people with art, then it becomes like something else, you know, then it becomes like uh, a force. I first became aware of him in the 60s um, through his work, um, Blues People and his play Dutchman. Kiss my black ass. If you don't understand that, it's you that's doing the kissing. <laughs> Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker, all the hip white boys scream for bird and bird singing up your ass. Evil-minded old bay. Up your ass! They sit there talking about the tortured genius of Charlie Parker. Shit. Bird would have played not a note of music. He just walked up East 67th Street and killed the first 10 white people he saw. Not a note! And I'm the big would-be poet. Yeah, that's right, poet. Some kind of bastard literature. All it takes is a simple knife thrust. 
Hey, let me read you, you loud whore, and one poem vanished. Shit. Oh, people are neurotic, struggling to keep from being sane. When the only thing that would cure the neurosis would be your murder. Simple as that. I mean, if I murdered you, then other white people would begin to understand me. <laughs> you understand? <laughs> no, I guess not. If Bessie Smith had killed her some white people, she wouldn't have needed all that music. She could have talked very straight and plain about the world. No grunts, no metaphors, no wiggles in the dark of her soul. Just straight two and two or four. Money, power, luxury, like that. Shit. Crazy niggas turning their backs on sanity when all it takes is that simple act. Murder, just murder would make us all sane. Um, kind of, um, you know, when he did Slave Ship, I was there. And, you know, just as we, uh, you walk in, you know, and you sit down, and we sitting there chatting and everything, and the lights went down, you know, and the next thing we knew, we were on the ship. Okay. And that was an incredible experience. I, I'll never forget that. It was in a little theater uh, in the Brooklyn Academy. They have since, I guess, reorganized, reconfigured the Brooklyn Academy, but it was up in there. And we were on the slave ship. And apparently, before they opened the doors of the theater, all of these people were put into place, you know. And so you just went and you sat down, you know, in this small theater. And when the lights went down, people started moving and moaning and groaning, who had been there all of the time. Okay. The ship became alive, and you were on the ship. And that was an incredible experience. It really was to see that. Feeling that, um, that if we want to be really militant, what we should do is try to get ourselves actually back into the state of mind that our people must have been in when they first brought them here. I didn't think you could be more militant than that, you know, because then you, <laughs> uh, it seems to me when somebody had just taken you away from your home, you know, you would probably all fire, you were probably all made to fire, you know. So then we try to conceive of of uh, actually creating the slave ship the way it would be, you know, with what would that be like, you know, being in the, in down there underneath the deck and being there, you know, and the stage directions have things like, you know, we had, we should create smells and, you know, the whole sounds and for a long time the theater should be black and all we hear is the sound of the people screaming and but slave ship was basically like a vignette and I think Again, what marred it was essentially not understanding slavery. You know what I mean? I, I took it. Uh, although I think the people that got killed in slave ship, you know, were the people that needed to get killed. You know, uh, <laughs> the traitor and, and the slave masters. They, I would still say they need to get killed now, see? But I think what I'm saying is I didn't understand slavery, like what created slavery, like the development of capitalism and... Uh, you know, why the capitalists need slaves, you understand, and that, and who were the actual overseers. Then I understood how advanced he was in terms of poetry, in terms of expressing himself, and how he was developing a reputation. But later, um, when the 70s um, presented, um, when the 70s came into being, I had the opportunity of working um, with him uh, the African Liberation Support Committee that he had a, a high position um, in and I was a member of. And I was able to firsthand see his organizing abilities, his, um, his commitment um, to the struggle, his commitment to um, basically making us uh, a better people, a better uh, African people. At that time, he was um, dealing with uh, the, the African concept um, before, this was before he became Marxist. I also became a part of House of Kuumba, which was run by his sister. I was um, a musician in residence there, and he would come through sometimes and speak. I was able to see him on television, um, a show called Soul. Uh, channel uh, 13, I think it was Ellis Hayslip, when he would do his material. I was able to hear some of his recordings, uh, uh, and I was very impressed with his style of delivery. Um, I was basically becoming more and more an admirer of him as a person.
have been deeply inspired by his spoken word, his courage, uh, his work, and knowledge about uh, our culture, and just in the way that he represents without holding back. He speaks truth. Uh, he's been someone who we would have to say is a living icon and someone that I certainly respect immensely. Um, as many people may be aware, uh, he's been recently brought into controversy for speaking out about something that people did not have a clear view of and also highly misinterpreted. And I honor his ability to stand for what he believes in and to always remain true and to remain connected to our community and to remind those who may forget, if only for a moment, who we are, our history, where we come from, and our purpose in life. Uh, the next guest, you could call him many things. He's been called a poet, an essayist, a playwright, a novelist, an activist, and you can call him all those things and you'd be absolutely correct. But that's just scratching the tip of the iceberg. It's over 13 published volumes of poems, 20 plays, three jazz operas, and the list goes on and on and on and on and on. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, legendary Amiri Barak. an excerpt from a poem called Why Is We Americans? But reality is an excerpt on television. Why is we Americans? Why is we Americans? Budida, 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 Budida. Big dee 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 boo dee boo dee boo boo boo. What I want is me, for real. I want me and myself and what that is is what I be and what I see and feel and who is me and the what it is and who it is and when it me is what it be. I'm gonna be here if I want, like I said, self determination. But I ain't come from a foolish tribe. We wants the mule, the land. You can make it 300 years of blue chip stock in the entire operation. We want to be paid in a central bank. The average worker, farmer wage for all those years we gave it free. Plus, we want damages for all the killings and the fraud, the lynchings, the missing justice, the lies and frame ups, the unwarranted jailings, the tar and feathering, the character and race assassinations, historical slander, ugly caricatures. For every Sambo, step and fetch it flick, we want to be paid. For every hurtful thing, you did or said for all the land you took for all the rapes all the rosewoods and black wall street you destroyed all the miseducation jobs lost segregated shacks we lived in the disease that ate and killed us for all the mad police that drilled us for all the music and dances you stole the styles the language the hip clothes you cop the careers you stop all these are suits specific litigation as represent we be like we for reparations for damages paid to the afro-american nation we want education for all of us and anyone else in the black pelt hurt by slavery for all the native peoples even them poor white people you show all the time is funny all them abners and daisy mays them beverly hillbillies who never got to know beverly hills who never got to harvard on their grandfather's wills we want reparations for them right on for the mexicans whose land you stole for all of north mexico you call it texas arizona california new mexico colorado all that all that all that all that be dee da do do Ba, 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 do, do, do. All that you got to give up. Autonomy and reparation to the Chicanos and the Native Americans whose soul you ripped out with their land. Give self-determination, regional autonomy. That's what my we is asking, and they're going to do the same when they demand it like us again in their own exploited name. Yeah, the education, that's right. 200 years. We want a central stash, a central bank with democratically elected trustees and a board elected by us all to map out from the referendum we set up what we want to spend it on to build that Malcolm sense self-determination as self-reliance and self-respect and self-defense the will of what the good dr du bois beat on true self-consciousness simply the psychology of freedom budida budida pedida budida that ba 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 budi budi boo 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 then we can talk 
about being American. Then, then we can, then, then we can listen. Then we can listen without the undercurrent of desire to first set your ass on fire. We will only talk of voluntary unity of autonomy as vective arms of self-determination if there is democracy in you. That is where it will be shown. This is the only way we as Americans, this is the only truth that can be told. Otherwise, there is no future between us but war and we as rather lovers and singers and dancers and poets and drummers and actors and runners and elegant heartbeats of the sun's flame. But we is also at the end of our silence and sit down. We is at the end of being under your ignorant smell, your intentional hell. Either give us our lives or plan to forfeit your own. This morning, the students assembled here are going to engage Brother Baraka in a discussion of his award-winning play, The Dutchman. Brother Baraka, thank you. Sure. We'd, we'd like to begin uh, with a question that a brother posed to you during the last period. Uh, I don't know if Robert is here. But he asked you what was the inspiration for the writing of uh, the Dutchman. Well, you know, always um, any kind of art is actually a kind of ideological uh, reflection of, of, of the world in the context that you live in. I was living downtown, a village uh, with white folks. In fact, I wasn't married to a white woman before that. Oh, no, at, at, after that, not. But the point was that Obviously, in my head, my feelings themselves, I was coming to some kind of crisis that I wasn't even aware of. I think most artists, if they really are trying to deal with truth and beauty, that's what Keats and Du Bois said, truth and beauty. You know, Du Bois said, a lover of beauty must become the lover of truth. So you, if you're writing, you're writing not to say something you know, you know, although that's going to be in it. But to say something that you don't even know you knew, you see. So I started writing that play about 12 o'clock at night. Because I had, you know, I said, well, this is a long story. Thelonious Monk was down the street, blah, blah, blah. I came in, and, uh, you know, I got this urge to write which is normal for me, you know. But I was writing, and then I could see um, that something was happening, because first of all, and I read this in a, in a critic named George Thompson from Great Britain, a very interesting book, talks about the theater. He said, whenever there's a revolutionary upsur upsurge, theater becomes the main, you know, artistic entity of progressive artists. That is, I began to see my poetry have characters in it. You know, I'd be writing a poem, and then one of the characters, I put Paul, what are you doing? You know, and I put Jethro, go ask me. But I wasn't planning to do that. You know, the, the, the poem began to need people walking around. It, you know what I'm And so this particular play, I started out with a description of what was in my mind, the subway. You know, the subway. Because the subway is underground. And underground is under people's consciousness. You understand what they, what's actually going on beneath their calm facade is all kind of wild stuff. You understand? So that's where I began. I began plumbing the subway, the subway, the subway. And and you know a lot of this stuff I can talk about now. You know what? Forty years later, something like that. But I didn't really know what I was doing. I mean, you know, the stuff was coming. It was coming. It was coming. Obviously, like I said. Your mind, your memory, you know, your feelings, your emotions, you know, your perception, your rationale, your use of all that. And uh, to be a writer, one has to have, be in touch with one's own physiology as well. You know, I don't know, that might seem strange, but I don't think anybody can write who, who, who came, who's not, you know, with me. I don't believe that. Because a lot of times the words are coming out based on the rhythms that you have. You know what I'm saying? 
That's like there. So that rhythm is actually tuning in a path in your mind. You understand? It's like it's 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 psychological, physiological, ideological. You understand? Because you know you could the same person can see the same thing. And the context of their own development, environmental interventions into their development means they see something different. So I began to write about this thing, you know, clay. Clay, why do they call it clay? You know, somebody. You know, uh, Lula. Why Lula? I was thinking, I think, of Lulu, which was uh, Berg's play in Vutsak. She was a crazy woman, Lula. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I wasn't saying, now I'm going to do it. This was just bam, 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 bam. Because you can't slow down when you're doing that. You have to try to keep up with your mind. It's very hard. And the whole mise-en-scene, the French call it, you know, the, the scene, what was going on, was just something that was coming bam, 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 bam. I didn't sketch it out. It was coming bam, bam. Like I said about the gun, Tim, boom, 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 boom. Then I finished it about three or four in the morning. Maybe the sun was coming up, maybe five o'clock. And I said, I was too tired really to read it. I was just thought, what is this shit? Because it actually was beyond, I mean, the stuff that was going on between this black man and this white woman, I hadn't conceived of consciously. You understand what I mean? But obviously it was coming to that. You know, finally just like you walk up and you do something and you say, holy gee, you mean I, that's what's in my mind? And that's the way, if you're writing, if you're an artist, you, you scare yourself a lot of times. Because you won't, you, you're not ready for what your mind is ready for. You understand? That is, your consciousness is deeper than your mouth. <laughs> you know, you might say anything. You know what I mean? It's like a lot of people, you see, they bad when you see them. Well, blah, blah, blah. When they get under pressure, what happens? You know, it's what is inside that's actually the thing that motivates you. We're going to give these brothers and sisters sure. the opportunity to engage you in dialogue. Please. But before they queue up and pose <laughs> their questions to you, I just want to share something with you. When I um, was a freshman in college um, in another part of this country, I happened to be only one of three black people in the entire school. And it was one of those situations where if you were a person of color, you caught all kinds of hell. Absolutely. And I can remember vividly one time when I was in a business law class and I happened to be the person who could answer the questions, my uh, professor said to me, said to the body of students, all white, that I must have had that class before. He couldn't, <laughs> you know, he couldn't conceive of me as being able to answer that question and compete with those people who didn't look like me. Uh, I encountered the Dutchman that year, and I said earlier that for me, you personified what um, Ossie Dav Davis said about Malcolm when he described him as our shining black manhood. Because in that environment, in that milieu, with all that madness, that assault on my consciousness, mm -hmm. the assault in me as a, as a black man, um, as a person who was just trying to make his way through the world, was so <coughs> profound until it, it changed me irrevocably. And I began to think about, when I saw, uh, when I read The Dutchman, I began to think about Clay and Lulu, and I, I said, I wonder who is Clay? Who, who, who is um, Lulu? Is, is Lulu white America? Is she's, she's a temptress, she's well, a big couple. It's a composite, you see, it's like, it's a composite, you know. Uh, you know, it's like there, there's half a Lulu, this half a Lulu, that half a Lulu, that half a Lulu. I know several uh, crazy white women and a couple of crazy black women who all is mixed up in that. And Clay is not only obviously autobiographical to a certain extent, but there are people in there who, who I know, who I was, okay. who I was becoming as I wrote it. You know, what I mean, I, you know, friend of yours. You know, uh, who is the Dutchman um, somebody from Amsterdam? Right? The people who originally. It's not the Dutchman. That's okay. what they. It's a Dutchman. Dutchman. I got that. I got that from. Let me tell you where I got it from. I got it from the movie with Ava Gardner and James Mason. Okay. <laughs> the Flying Dutchman where the dude has to sail around, you know, he's evil, he can't die, and he's fated to sail around the world forever until he finds someone that'll love him. But that comes from something deeper than I knew then. 
Okay. It comes from, uh, well, first of all, the first slave ship was a Dutch man of war. Okay. Exactly. I didn't know that then. Exactly. I ain't going to say I knew that then, but it, obviously I knew it. You, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, obviously you knew it. I mean, I didn't know I knew it. You know, somebody said, well, why you name it that? I, I don't know. I saw the movie, but the movie was saying something that struck something in your head. What? That that was a slave ship. He was underground. You understand? And here's a dude in a slave ship trying to make it with the mis <laughs> slave mistress. I mean, you know, he don't know no better. You understand? I mean, he thinks that, like she said, you think everything you say is great, don't you? you know, I mean, you know, that kind of fill with you. Well, who do you think you are? She sa he says, well, I was in college. I thought it was Baudelaire. <laughs> I slowed well, down. Yeah. And she <laughs> says, what? Well, I bet you never want to study you were a black, black nigga. nigga. See, but that, I mean, that's to try to cut through that, the, you know, the pomposity of our own disguises. You know what I'm saying? Uh, obviously, you know, I was walking around the campus reading Baudelaire, talking about flower of evil, blah, 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 blah. Hey, <laughs> what would you say to the Klansmen when you're reading Baudelaire? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, w it was like the, the kind of that cut, cutting through the, the mask that Fanon talks about. Black skin, white mask. Right. Trying to make it in the white world, and then seeing, hey, I can't do that. You know, I mean, I, I, am not gonna do that. I am not that sick. You know, and like I told you before, when, when I, I wasn't clear until the play came out, how deep I had gone into the exit of that particular life. I, I wasn't really clear until I saw that on the, on the page and. All these white critics would call me nuts. You know, crazy black man, he hate white people. So I had never thought of it quite that way, but now that you mention it. <laughs> okay, going, okay. Um, going on to what you were saying about how you said the critics were talking about, you know, you were crazy and everything for writing this play that you um, hate white people. How did that make you feel? Because obviously it sent a message to How did it make me feel? It opened a door in my head. You know, because then what I thought, like I said before, I said, oh, they're going to make me famous. There's like eight, nine newspapers, you know. This man is, this man is pictures, this man is pictures. Because before that, I was an obscure little black poet running around the village who did the wildest <laughs> stuff you can imagine. I don't even think you can imagine. But at that very moment, when I thought that they were going to actually call my name out in the world, you understand? So that people would know, oh, that's you, then a terrible sense of responsibility came out of me. I mean, Suddenly, I, I knew that I had to stop acting a fool. You know what I mean? I was not, I was no longer a boy. You know, I had sold my wild oats, you know what I'm saying? So I thought about my grandmother, my grandfather, all the more black people, you know, uh, all the stories they had told me every night at dinner time. Remember that time that white boy cut them in the blah, 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 blah. Remember that lynching down and so, 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 so. Remember that stuff down there? And they talking to you trying to get the biscuits. They passed <laughs> chicken please and they're actually <coughs> teaching you the history of your people you, you understand what I mean yeah. you're sitting there listen and then one day see you carry it around your head you don't know what is in one day so, pop! So, oh that's why they told me this, so I could kick these people's ass see I mean that that's that's the, that was the clarity I didn't realize what my life had been until suddenly there I was facing the bullseye with a pistol in my hand that is my weapon was my art I said, now feel this, bam, because I had the experiences. You see? So then when people say, well, why are you this way? I'm that way because I'm a son of Afro-America. You know what I'm saying? Somebody been bothering my mother and father and grandma, and I'm going to get them. That's the way I felt about that. It wasn't like, no, it's no. No, I'm the son of black, I'm black, I'm their son. <laughs> and I'm going to do what they need do, done if I can. Amen. That's all. I'm going to stray too far away from the play, but, um, I just wanted to know, what are your feelings about how Castro treats the people in Cuba? How? What are my feelings about it? I support Fidel Castro. I mean, I don't know how nobody can ask about anything in the world living here. They have tried to destroy Fidel. Who was it? Now, let me, let me count all the fools that tried that. <laughs> was Eisenhower, was he the first one? Or Kennedy? Mm -hmm. Picks. And then Nixon, Ford. See, to try to build socialism, Anywhere in the world, it's a dangerous. Check out Nicaragua, the Sandino, what they do to them, you know. Uh, check out Grenada, Maurice Bishop, what they did to them. Check out what they're doing now to uh, Chavez in, in uh, 
Venezuela. You, you understand what I'm saying? Uh, go check out what they did to the Soviet Union, the Russians, you know. They do not want equitable distribution of wealth. They do not want the, 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 the productive forces, the means of production, the factories, the land, the institution be controlled by the people. They do not want democracy. Now, they just cut out all, all funding for the arts. So where are you going to get funded, poor artists? You either going to become a prostitute for Ford Foundation or a Rockefeller Foundation. You understand what I mean? Yeah. Or are you going to walk around? Or are you going to be smart enough and intelligent enough to begin to create your own things? You understand what I mean? If you can't go to Hollywood, you need to get in one of them, one of them storefronts you understand? And build you a stage and put a sign that says, Gina is at it. I mean, rather than be standing around waiting for them to discover you, in quotes, and make you into something they want. Yeah, they say, he could have been. Yeah, I could have been when I was ignorant. You understand? But the more conscious, like Fred Douglas, <clears throat> in the narrative, you ever read, who ever read the slave narratives? Remember Fred, once he learns to read, he says what? This is agony. This is agony. This is horrible. What is he talking about? When he was ignorant, you know, it's cool. Everything was cool. He was ignorant. He don't know no better. But once he actually became conscious, then he hated it. He hated it because he knew better. You know, it's hard for me. Why I tell my kids read all, all the newspapers and stuff like that? Because it's hard for me to do that. I read two and three newspapers a day, but it's very difficult because um, it will drive you out of your mind. If you actually see everything and say, that's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie, that's a lie. You know, what you, like they got this blood on the cover of Newsweek. Y'all seen that? What's oh, his yeah. name? Um, Blair? Yeah. Sure. So you say, okay, this boy they got on Newsweek, he got fired. Uh, he's supposed to be, uh, 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 you know, dishonest. He's supposed to be a, a drug user. He's supposed to be a liar. Okay, solid, beautiful. He, he probably the first one in the world. But... <laughs> then you go, he got fired. So then you, you go past that and you say, well, what is in here? You're looking at it. The editor has views that oppose Bush. The, the managing editor is black. They end up by saying, we're not going to say that affirmative action is responsible for it. Now, take this, you mean you went from this? To affirm the last, well, that means the next white person that do something evil, I need to nix them from hiring them. I don't hire no more white people when I'm stole something. <laughs> but I'm saying what it was is so is so uh, insidious, because they put the Negro on the cover. They against affirmative action. Remember that they sent black and Latinos to war last month, and they dismissed affirmative action at the same time. This is another anti-affirmative action. All of this, and you get down to what? And they say, to the extent that the New York Times has been, you know, besmirched by this scandal is the extent to which the government becomes more powerful. You know, they're really playing the game. What is it? You don't want no affirmative action. They send you over there to fight at the same time they get out veterans. Right? I'm saying this. Obviously, racism cannot be destroyed in Cuba just by saying you're socialist. You understand? But to compare Cuba with this bullshit here is just... <laughs> nauseating to me. It's nauseating to me. So is that? And I've been in every jail in this area. No, I mean, how can Bush, somebody who done killed thousands and thousands of people, talk about democracy? Where? Who? Why? The man who killed more people in Texas as the governor than the rest of the states combined. I was just wondering yeah. what it was that you admired about him because you said that um, him and somebody else, Malcolm X, Malcolm X that um, they're like your heroes, they inspired you. But um, I don't. I just can't understand how. You you haven't studied it. That's why. Well, all I know right now. I know it. That's what that's. What that. I do know <laughs> is that my family in Cuba can't eat. Yeah. Why so is I'm that? Just, what? Who do you think is in charge of that? What about who has got? Who has got the embargo on exactly. Cuba for the last exactly. thirty years? Exactly. These people. Exactly. Why? Was well, Cuba a threat to them? Exactly. Was Grenada a threat to them? Exactly. Is Venezuela a threat to them? Was Nicaragua a threat to them? You know what I mean? So you, see, you, you know, was Lumumba a threat to them? Exactly. Or Sebenko or Biko? You understand? These people here have the power to, they want to control the world. Not, the reason they jumping at me, because I made the remarks about 911. Because we know, I know this, 
None of this other job is possible without that. If it don't be for 911, don't be no Palestinians getting ethnic cleansed by this Sharon. I mean, you mean a Palestinian blows this up from the bus, horrible thing, but that's terrorism. You mean when, when the Israelis go over there and blow up the whole town, that ain't terrorism, that's self-defense. Why is all Bush's enemies colored people? You know, I ain't make that up, check them out. You know. So they got Afghanistan first, Osama bin Laden. Is he in his building? Has like, anybody met him? I mean, do we, well, no, that was Osama, that was last month. Then they did change to who? Saddam Hussein, yeah. Then they changed to Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein, have they found anything no. yet? The most dangerous weapon of mass destruction is bullshit. That's what I think. Or B U S H apostrophe I T. Bullshit. <laughs> you know. we, may, we, may, we may revisit um, Gina's question sure. a little later. I think, I, think, well, I, one thing. I think it would be good if you, my son, and them go down there regularly. You should go down back with them. Oh, I mean, don't be afraid. It's this country that's causing it. The Cubans didn't make us slaves. White Americans did, you know. I got a question. <laughs> if it's this country, then why are you still a country? If you're saying it's just this country, you're saying it's, that it's like the government. It's white people, right? It's not white people. It's the system and the government, of course. And why should I leave? This is my home. This is your home, but you're saying it like... It needs to be changed. To be you can live in a stinking house. <laughs> if you don't clean it up, and sit there suffocating with the stink. <laughs> If I see the Ku Klux Klan, <laughs> what am I supposed to say? They're nice because the Americans know I cut their head off. <laughs> no, it's like killing rats and roaches. You can't live with no rats and roaches. I think this brother had a, had a question first. Yes, I did have a question. Um, with the actor that portrayed Clay, I mean Clay in the, um, in the movie in The Dutchman, how do, you feel, how do you feel that he portrayed your person? Did, did he have the My person, you mean the, the Clay, the character? Yes. He, um, Actors, and you all want to be actors, actors are like any artist. You deal with, 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 the, with, the, with the objective aspect of it, mm -hmm. the script, so on, so on. but you also de deal with your own conceptualization of it. You know what I mean? There's, I thought Al Freeman and Bobby Hooks, they were the first ones mm -hmm. to do it. You know, it was Al Freeman, it was Bobby Hooks up in the in the theater when it opened because they couldn't get out. Then later it was Al Freeman and uh, uh, who played it. I thought Al was Al was one of the best ones I saw. The guy who played uh, Elijah Muhammad in X. Oh. oh. Yeah. See, he's aged. That was he on you saw on the screen. He was the first clay. And he was a powerful. He was a strong, powerful, very masculine actor. And I like that. You know. Um, but see, you all haven't, that's a long time, you haven't experienced what theater was then, because theater has become like the rest of America. It's, it's laid down, it's got fat and backward and corrupt. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we did, we did um, the slave, no, we did the slave ship, the thing you saw, and uh, the actors actually start selling babies to the critics. I'm talking about real babies. You know, we, we got a, we got a, we were auctioning, and they would come over there, and, you know, that critic, what was his name, from the New York Times. He would say, you know, because we would call him and say, soul to you. You know, he put that, they put that baby in the man's arm. He's like, wow, what? Why you put it? But that's, the, I'm saying, we were so aggressive then. We, 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 were so, we were much more aggressive. And the black arts up in, up in Harlem, we did that stuff every night. Um, one, one play we opened with the guy chasing somebody down the street, shooting blanks. Now, you know, I would be kind of, you know, I would be kind of uh, less likely to do that now. But... <laughs> The student was chasing, chasing him down the street, bam, 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 and he ran into the playground. And the Negroes tried to act like they wasn't looking, like they was going, you know, going away. Somebody shooting a gun at somebody. You, but then all of a sudden there was a crowd in there trying to see if he was dead, and we began our play. I mean, we would do a lot of wild things then because you know we were young, we had no sense, we'd do anything. You know. Yeah. I'm sorry. So was Lula a representative of? white racist or like white America, how it's corrupt nowadays? Yeah, in a sense, America, in its seductive way, you know, that's what they do, just carry the stick. You know, America can either seduce you, you know, that is bribe you, you know, uh, or they can uh, kill you, just with a thing. When he says, well, I think I'll get off, you know, I ain't going for this, you know, but the point, was wrong with him is that he thought that it was about him still. You know, 
Uh, who needs it? He says. Be safe with my words. You can't be safe with your words. One of the greatest writers this country has ever produced, Henry Dumas, a great writer whose works you should read, was killed right up here in Harlem, exactly. uh, going over a, a, a turnstile. Exactly. 1968. Yeah, I mean, he, you say, don't kill him, he's a great writer. You can't be safe with your words. In fact, he is the, the, one of the principal influences on Toni Morrison. I don't know people. He wrote The Ark of Bones and Play yeah. Ebony, Play Ivory. Play Ebony, Play Ivory is the book of poetry. The Ark of Bones is the book of short stories. Um, anyway, we should continue this because uh, we're under the tyranny of the clock. Um, you had another question, I believe. I did. Uh, 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 so how do you compare life back then when he was living to how it is now? You still, think that we're blind, you still think we're blind to... In back where? Like you, you saying that when you was growing up, things was different, and that you learned to see things. So you think this generation is going to well, see things the way you did? Yeah. Well, see, what, what it is is again, Du Bois. <laughs> I keep saying Du Bois, Du Bois, Du Bois, Mao, Mao, Mao. Because I want you to read him. Do my stuff, you know. But when Du Bois talks about the Sisyphus syndrome, you know what that is? You know, Sisyphus yeah. is the Greek myth, pushing that rock up to the top of the mountain, and it comes right back down. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, you never get anywhere. Push it That's up, right. comes right back down. That's what Du Bois described as Afro American uh, life. He said, because Sisyphus actually was the son of the wind god. Hmm. Right. And death came to him and said, okay, Sisyphus, it's time for you to die. Sisyphus said, no, I'm not dying. So as punishment, they made him push a rock up to the top of the mountain. So let's look at it. Anti-slavery movement, abolitionists, you understand? Fred Douglas, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, you know, Nat Turner. Dun, 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 push it up. You understand? Then, bam, they kill Lincoln. They, you know what? veto the reconstruction, you know, they set up the Ku Klux Klan, you know, they have the black codes, and suddenly the rock is rolling back down on the head. So that by 1896, separate but equal, which is Jive, and a Negro named Booker T. Washington who endorsed that, so that the 20th century first begins with Du Bois criticizing Booker T. Washington. That is, to turn the rock back around, you have to stop the momentum of it going down. You have to say, what is, what, what, why are we still following? Why are we still fighting? Well, here we are. What is this, 2003? Mm -hmm. A lot of this stuff is happening now. We thought we had beat in 1970. Affirmative action. <laughs> the man just nixed that. See, uh, that was only a small step, but that means what for you all? You understand? Um, a lot of these very dangerous Negroes walk around there with good jobs, got those jobs only to affirmative action, exactly. only to the people struggle. It's sickening exactly. to see a Negro who could never be in nothing like, uh, what is it, in, uh, what is it, barbershop? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, you know, I can't talk too bad about barbershop because I went to sleep, actually. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I was just trying to figure out why, you know, you can say anything you want to, but why pick out Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks to talk bad? You know, I say, don't you understand, Negro? It wasn't for them. You would be in a real barbershop, cutting real hair. Wouldn't be no movie neither. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But that kind of ignorance, that ignorance, allows you to be used by anybody. You understand? That's what I said. When they see that vacuum in your eyes, <laughs> they'll reach in there and take your brain and use it. The bell has indicated that indicates that we're going to have to bring this particular. Um, part of our day to um, our conclusion. Uh, having said that, uh, Brother Baraka, uh, again, on behalf of the entire Wadley community, and in particular those brothers and sisters who continue to, to follow the example that you've set, and the examples of the Sojourner Chews and the Harriet Tudman, mm -hmm. and all the, the brothers and sisters who continue to fight diligently without compromise, um, we, we thank you. Um, and this is to be continued. Peace. If you're drowning and there's nothing around for help but a board floating, you're going to reach out for that board. And this was our board. Look, what you know about me, man?